Hey there, this is Steve Lee with Veritas Catholic Network. These are now the most solemn days of the year, leading us into the incredible glory of Jesus' resurrection. So today, Bishop Caggiano is going to prepare us and walk us through the events of the Passion of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you are having a truly blessed Holy Week. Uh, we'll be broadcasting special programs throughout the Triduum, um, including Masses from Rome and Washington, D.C., Stations of the Cross, and Meditations on the Lord's Passion and Death. So keep your radio here on 1350 AM, or you can participate using the Veritas Catholic Network app on your phone. All right, and I want to welcome you all back to Let Me Be Frank, and it is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce the birthday boy, I guess, boy, <laughs> of Bishop Frank Caggiano. <laughs> oh, I wish. Forget boy. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Steve. Thank so Monday you. Monday was your birthday, Excellency, so happy yes. birthday. Thank you. Thank you. I'm 62 years old. I am officially a senior citizen now. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Think about it. Because now, te technically, you could apply for an early pension from Social Security, which most people don't do. But, yeah. You, you know, know what? One friend, one, yes. You know what one friend said to me, texted me, he goes, he says, Frank, you will never again pay full price for coffee. <laughs> I, I thought, what a great I, What a great <laughs> benefit. <laughs> what a bright side. You know, you know, the thing is, Excellency, is that um, 62 is so young. And you are clearly young and, 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 you know, it's not, when I was a kid, I always felt like 62, I always felt like 48, which is what I am, was so old. But I mean, mm -hmm. look at you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what it is? It, of course. I mean, you know, death comes when death wishes, when the Lord wills it, I suppose, when he permits it. You know, I have a classmate who died at 27. I had a, another classmate who died at 49. So, I mean, but it, it is a rite of passage, and it is important to reflect. Okay, so now, not to get too melodramatic, but at 62, it is undeniable that most of my life is behind me, not in front of me. And it is a good opportunity for all of us to sit and reflect on what is it that I could offer the Lord if today were, in fact, the last day of my life. What, what, what would I show for those 62 years of life? What have I learned during those years? What lessons have not yet quite sunk in, right? Which is important too to admit. So in many ways, um, so I'm not a big birthday fan, as you know, I don't like to celebrate birthdays. Um, everyone in the office has gotten used to that after eight years together. <laughs> but but because they are actually for me more of a reflective day than a celebratory day right so 62 i'm not going to live to 125 <laughs> so the majority <laughs> of my life is is in this world is over right. so it is an important thing so therefore i think everybody who celebrates a birthday as you get older use it as a time of reflection and prayer like almost like a day of prayer to say what do you want to do in the year ahead yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so uh let's Let's talk, you know, kind of, that's kind of a good transition because we're here in Holy Week, mm -hmm. um, which is the holiest, I mean, obviously it's called Holy Week. So let's kind of, if you don't mind, Excellency, let's kind of mm -hmm. walk through Christ's passion one day at a time, and mm -hmm. we can start with tomorrow, which is Holy Thursday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Help us meditate maybe what, on what happened in that upper room. Mm -hmm. Well... Um, Jesus entered Jerusalem four or five days before, I suppose, um, four days before, and was greeted with the exultation of a crowd, expecting him to liberate the city. Finally, they would be liberated. And um, what they got was nothing. And one of the first lessons is the upper room was more of a refuge. You see, because... When you read sacred scripture, you need to read, forgive me for being a bit poetic, the unwritten words as much as you read the written words. So imagine 
how the tenor of the city began to change when Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, where are these troops? Where is this liberation? What's going on? So by the time you get to Thursday, um, the Lord knew this, this was the time. So the upper room was almost more of a refuge, right? It's like gathering your family together to give them the last instructions, which is exactly what the Lord did. Although they themselves did not appreciate that, right? They yeah. did not realize. But he was preparing them for what happened because the mood outside had soured, right? And when the crowd was asked, as you know, to choose Jesus or Barabbas, the next day they chose Barabbas because they were incited by the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes. So that's the first, it's the first thing, is you have to feel the mood and how could those who saw Jesus do so much good so quickly turn against him? See, it's, it's all about me. It's my life is about me. This is what I want you to do. This is what you have to do for me to liberate me the way I think I should be liberated. Okay? So it's almost a triumph of selfishness in the moment. Yeah. And of course, the interesting thing is the Lord celebrates the great sacrament that allows us centuries later, to enter into grace in the very moment of, of his death and resurrection. So the upper room is the place where he feeds. First, he teaches his apostles. Then he feeds them. And he takes the Passover Pasch and he interprets it in a much more profound and divine way because he's now speaking of the Passover of his life, from life, through death, to glory, to reveal to the world who he was all along. And we must not forget the fact that his agony is real, his suffering is real, his death is real in his human life. There's not play acting here. Yeah. Um, but his heart was at peace because his heart was not divided by sin. So we cannot appreciate Jesus is suffering because it would have been different from ours because we're conflicted. He is not right. He never was But it was yeah. real nonetheless you hit him it hurt you cut him he bled right So he's giving them this catechism and he's giving them the food of eternal life So that they could participate through grace without having to have themselves bruised, beaten, broken, and crucified. Right? He's doing it for us. Right? But then he does the washing of the feet. Now, tell me, your experience growing up, going to Holy Thursday, Mass of the Lord's Supper, what was your reaction when you saw the washing of the feet? Um, when I was a kid, I didn't really know what to think. But as... As I got older and I learned the, the meaning of it and why Jesus did it, I mean, what an incredible, not just an act of humility, but a lesson for us, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and again, the unspoken word, who washed feet? Servants washed feet. Mm -hmm. Servants who did not share in the meal. Remember when Jesus in Scripture says, if your servant comes in from the field, are you going to say to your servant, sit at the meal and eat with me, or would, would you not rather say, go prepare my meal and serve it for me? Right. So the servants did not do that. And Jesus commented in the sacred Scripture how often he would go into the houses of the Pharisees and scribes, and no one would offer to wash his feet, which was customary for a guest. All right, And yet uh, Mary bathes his feet with perfumed oil. We just heard the gospel on Monday yes. of Holy Week. Yep. You know, it's interesting. I'm reading a book, Divine Intimacy, and Father Gabriel says, Mary is the image of consecrated life, whose soul is, whose soul is totally fixed on Jesus, not the earthly chores of this world, solely on Jesus, an undivided heart, which is beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so he teaches them that he who is master will love them literally to the end, 
to 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 debase himself, if I could put it that way, to wash their feet. Right. So this is the God who is who is the master, creator, and savior, is washing the feet of his creatures. Now let's think about that for a second. It's beyond remarkable. You're almost speechless if you think about it. So that why? For two things. First, just like you said, Steve, so that we could do that for others. But secondly, it's to give the context for the Eucharist. Because how, in fact, will you wash the feet of the people around you? Do you think it's going to depend on your human energy or abilities or determination? You may do it for a little bit of time. But eventually you will weaken. It will not work. But it's only by the indwelling of the Lord, right? It's only by His grace can you do that. Can you love to the end? Can you go into the shadows? that you can actually embrace the feet of the people you meet. So, the, it, you know, we've spoken about the Eucharist many times, right, you and I, and how the Eucharist is this invitation to go into mission. Well, that's the mission. See, that's the mission. The washing of the feet is the mission of the Eucharist. And we often don't think of it in those terms. Because that's ultimately what the Lord is doing. Oh, the Lord's going to be stripped and beaten um, for ingrates, basically. Yeah. <laughs> the vast majority of people are ingrates. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, I think, it, it's quite a powerful catechism to reflect on. Is why the Lord, and of course, then you have Judas there. Oh, my goodness gracious. Talk about now, ingrate. What was going on in his head? <laughs> yeah. Right? You know, I had a very, I had a very, I would say it's, it was actually a profound moment, but it, it was, it was almost like a knife in my heart. I must confess, I must confess. Um, and it was only a few days ago. It, see, now in old age comes wisdom. You see, is that amazing how it's happening already? <laughs> um, I was reflecting on the fact that I've been given, and I'm very unworthy of it, this vocation to be a successor of the apostles. And we've also, you know, kind of joked around about whose successor are you? Mm -hmm. Well, I have only one in 12 chances of not being a successor to a traitor. Either the profound traitor, who is Judas, who refused to repent, the colossal traitor, who did repent, because ultimately he loved the Lord Jesus, and when the Lord looked at him, right, that moment of pure honesty provoked him to repentance, and then everybody else but John who ran. So I sat in my chair in, the, in, the, in front of the bus and I said, Lord, please, you know, forgive me for the times I've I've sinned. Every time I've sinned, I've betrayed you. It's so easy to be a traitor. Even in the highest echelons of the church. Right? So that's another lesson in that room. One of the traitors ran out of the room. But almost everybody left sooner or later before you got to Calvary. Except John. And then John says, and then it was night. It was night. What a powerful statement after Judas left. It was night before. All right? Because the Passover, the Passover is celebrated after dusk. Mm -hmm. But only when he betrayed, only when he left, right, was it night. And what did he betray Jesus for? 30 pieces of silver, which is the cost of purchasing a slave in, Roman, in the Roman Empire. A lot going on in that upper room. <laughs> a lot, a lot. And thank you for that, uh, first of all. Um, so how about uh, in, in the churches tonight, or I'm not tonight, in the churches on Holy Thursday, 
after mm-hmm. the mass. Mm-hmm. Um, then you have, and you talked about this a little bit uh, last year as well, the stripping of the altar, the yep. empty tabernacle, yep. the covered statues, yep. the silence. Right, right. But let's, let's, let's talk about veneration. So what are we commemorating in the, in the altars of repose? I, th- I think we are venerating the agony in the garden. Because we're keeping watch. Jesus says to his apostles, keep watch. He goes to the garden. And what do they do? They fall asleep. Mm-hmm. Three times. Three times. Because they're totally oblivious, right? We hope. To the battle that lies ahead. The great epic battle between evil and the power and grace of God. A battle which evil obviously loses, right? So we repose the Blessed Sacrament and sit in quiet because we're invited into the garden with Jesus. For he stays faithful, and what do we do? And that is why I must confess, as I've grown older, while I was a young man, I liked going to the seven churches. Now that I'm older, I would prefer to stay in one Hmm. and watch in the hours. Now, Who is the unspoken protagonist in the agony in the garden? Again, the unwritten word. Who's lurking in the shadows? Satan. Father of evil. Yeah. And in Mel Gibson's Temptation, um, uh, Passion. uh, The Passion of the Christ. It's The Passion of the Christ, right? Yes. Um, Which is now a while back. (laughs) I Remember the opening scenes of the film where he... um, he has this very strange depiction of the father of evil. Mm-hmm. Um, almost surreal. The, the word that comes to my mind every time I see it is like he's slimy. He's like yeah. slimy. Yeah. Okay. See, the father of evil is very much in the background in all the events of Holy Week. Because who lulled? the apostles to sleep, the temptation, right? They had just eaten, right? You can get groggy. And so he said, ah, take a rest. (laughs) Nothing going on. No big deal. You'll be better for the the little nap. You know, the whisperings. As, you know, as he did in the garden, well, as he did in the desert, so too in the garden, right? Right? Father, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but yours be done. See, to Jesus, whose heart was undivided, the Father of evil had had no sway, no hold, no grasp, nothing, nothing. But it didn't stop him from trying. (laughs) Right. But he had a field day with everybody else. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right? In the movie, though, except for Mary, Mm because as he goes, he makes eye contact tact with her throughout the events of the passion and she looks directly at him too of course I mean it's a because her heart was undivided too yeah and see and, and our lady is the great humid reproach hmm. because for all of us how many times have we said oh but Jesus yeah but Jesus yeah of course Jesus didn't say but Jesus was God what do you want I'm not God <laughs> right right as a kid I say that all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right so what about our lady alright so explain to me our lady yes our lady had the, the unique grace of being conceived without original sin. Yes, absolutely. But we have the grace of baptism that helps us to conquer those effects. And while we will not achieve perfection in this life, we should never excuse ourselves to simply say, well, the Lord didn't because the Lord was God, because Our Lady can stare the devil down. How come you and I can't sometimes? Yeah. 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 Right? So we go from, we go from the garden... Mm-hmm. Into this, into this transition into Good Friday, where mm-hmm. his suffering really does begin that night mm-hmm. once he's arrested, and you've talked a lot about this, um, about the word kenosis, this emptying of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you can kind of start there, Excellency, for for the listeners, and for me. Yeah, kenosis is the Greek word literally to empty out, and it's an ancient Christian hymn that Paul incorporates in the letter to the Philippians. It predates his writing. So it's one of the earliest hymns of the Christians. And in Philippians 2, it speaks of Jesus um, 
literally, it's, it's the mystery of the incarnation, right? So that Jesus empties of the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, empties himself of his divine glory and prerogatives, which are his, so that he could assume a human life in its integrity, so that his humanity is not a farce, it's not a show, it's real. And he, throughout his life on earth, voluntarily continues this kenosis. Because many a time he could have called a legion of angels and wiped them all out if he wanted to, but he didn't. And his human will and divine will were, were always in harmony, always in harmony. But I would like to say, I would like to suggest that Jesus' suffering begins in the Last Supper. Hmm. When teaching the apostles, knowing what they were going to do, realizing they still were going to run. In the agony in the garden, his suffering is there, clearly. Right? And then, before both the Sanhedrin and Pilate, so, the religious authorities that condemn him for blasphemy but do not have the authority to put someone to death. Turn to the state to use capital punishment, right, for the charge of presumably treason, so that they can put him to death. So ultimately, those who put Jesus to death were the Romans, was the civil state. And we know we have great controversy about capital punishment, but I will never tire of saying, right, for everyone listening, if you want to understand the true import of capital punishment, remember that Jesus was its victim. And if to abolish it would have saved one innocent life, is that not our Christian duty? God can judge when God chooses to judge the rest of humanity. But Je that is how Jesus died. And the truth of the matter is, okay, you know, we see this picture of Pilate conflicted. Well, who who is listening to this podcast is not conflicted when you confront the Lord and what he asks in honesty and clarity. And we waver. So, you know, Pilate is pathetic, but the truth is many a time I am pathetic. Chances are our listeners and you and all everybody else are pathetic too, right? We waver because we don't want to admit what the truth is. We want it to be in our image. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Simple as that. It's wrong. Yeah. So once again, so that's suffering because Jesus preached three years that we know of in his public ministry. And like, you say to yourself, but did you listen to anything I said? <laughs> really? Well, even Pilate, where were you, hiding under a rock? What were you, li living in the closet? Did you, I mean, that, that you didn't see, here or anything for three years? How could that possibly be? <laughs> <laughs> but they're deaf. Deaf. Yeah. Right? And you said even last year, you said that the reason you used the word pathetic, the adjective to describe Pilate, was because he asked what is truth when truth was standing there physically right. staring him right back in the face. Right. Right. And, and because he's pathetic, he's almost, in some sense, um, deserves pity. In a strange sort of way. Because did he really honestly understand that which he was really doing on that fateful day. The other thing, again, the unspoken word, right? So crucifixion was normal course of action. How many people did Pilate condemn to crucifixion? Insurrectionists, traitors, troublemakers, thieves, murderers, rapists, on and on and on. Jesus would have been one of a cast of many, but he really had, did he really have any idea? Yeah. But the fact that he was conflicted was his moment that he lost. Yep. I want to uh, continue this on the other side of the break, but we do have to take a quick break, Excellency. So you're listening to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. We are going to continue this walk through the Triduum on the other side of the break. 
Catholic Radio works, and now we have it here in Connecticut and New York. It's been seen around the country that there's no better tool for evangelization. Where there's Catholic Radio, the folks who listen deepen their faith, families are strengthened, parishes and communities flourish. So, let people know you're listening to Veritas, tell your friends to tune in, and let's make an impact here for Jesus and His Church. This is Steve Lee for Veritas Catholic Network. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. We are talking about the events now of Good Friday. And Excellency, you were just talking about Pontius Pilate. And I wanted to, you know, it just struck me as you were talking that there he is standing in front of Jesus. He had an encounter with Jesus, but he was not open to seeing who he was and how often that happens in the world. But even with us who are professed and you know, try to be devoted Christians, it just, all the time, I would think. Well, you see, if, if we were to try, which you should never really do, you know, willy-nilly, to enter into the psyche of Pontius Pilate, chances are, if you remember scripture, his wife was much more fascinated by the Lord than he was. Yes. But what did his wife not have that Pilate did have? And that is to answer to his higher authorities. See, he was a military man. Mm. So the last thing you need in military, the last thing you need as a politician as well, is to cause trouble for your uppers, those above you. Right. Right? And therefore, if he had let Jesus free, and Jesus would have continued to preach, and the city was in turmoil, could you imagine what would have come back to him. So his entire career probably was hanging in the balance as to what he did here. So ambition, pride, you know, the typical stuff. So when you look at us, what happens to us? Well, you know, ambition, mm -hmm. pride, ambition in the, in, in the secular world, where if you stand up for your Christian values, chances are you'll lose your promotion or you'll be the troublemaker, or you'll be the crazy one in the corner, all right? Pride. Because in the end, uh, what this Lord is asking you to uh, repent of your sins. Well, what sins? <laughs> I'm just doing what I, what I think is the right thing to do. Well, again, so, yeah, his wife actually had a clearer understanding of what was going on. Yeah. So then I wonder, I wonder, what happened to Pontius Pilate? What happened after the resurrection? What happened when, the, when they came back and reported that the body was missing? What happened in the city? It's interesting, right? We only focus then on what happens among people coming to faith. But what happens to the rest of them? Ironically, he may have inherited the same mess and his own failure. Yeah. So that was the icing on the cake. Because I'm sure there would have been rumors rampant throughout the city, perhaps some turmoil. Mm -hmm. So, see, it was inescapable, but he didn't do it for the truth. He didn't stand for what he probably knew in his heart was, was incorrect to do. So, so then Jesus goes off, and he's scourged, and he's crowned with thorns, and then he walks the Via Crucis, right? Um... It's interesting, why crowned with thorns? What do you think? If I were to ask you, I mean, there's no right or wrong answer here, but why that? Yeah, I mean, I think, think? I think most people are just taught that it's, uh, it's a mockery of, uh, you know, his kingship. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing there's something deeper here. Well... I, th I think without a doubt that is the case. But again, evil intends and God brings good. But is, it, is there a more powerful image of the true nature of authority than Jesus, the king of all things, wearing a crown of thorns? It's almost the next lesson after the washing of the feet. The washing of the feet teaches what authority really is 
And a king who wears a crown of thorns for his subjects is another lesson on what true authority is. Versus a crown made of gold. So it was, I mean, I can't imagine how torturous that was, especially the, the three times he fell and how all of those thorns would have just beaten into his, in his forehead. I mean, but to your point, it, 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 at least in my mind, it's a perennial lesson of what true authority means, right? Heavy is the crown upon which that sits on the head of the king. In this case, the crown explains to the world who the king is. And I think it's, 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 it's a, a powerful lesson for everyone in leadership in the church. Because we wear mitres. Hmm. But they're really meant to be what? Right? A symbol of our giving of our lives for our people. Right? Imagine suggesting to bishops to start wearing crown of thorns. <laughs> <laughs> the number of bishops will go down real fast. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> right. And the other interesting thing, which we talked about last year, is, you know, the resurrected Lord still bears the, the wounds, but not of the crown of thorns. Hmm. Why? Why? It's an interesting question to ask and reflect on. All right. So then... Um Um, okay, so let's let's talk about the Via Crucis, um, mm -hmm. and you know we we talk about this great movie, The Passion of the Christ, a lot. Um, but you know, I was just thinking about how it is portrayed uh, in that movie when Jesus was given his cross, he actually embraced it, he hugged it, and even one of the thieves looked over and said, "Why do you embrace your cross, you fool?" You know, and then. And then once they get to Golgotha mm -hmm. and the cross is there, the soldiers mm -hmm. don't pick him up and carry him and put him on the cross. He crawled himself onto the cross. He put himself there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's his, his willingness. His, Absolutely. Nobody did this to him. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question. I like questions, as you know. Again, a question for which you need to reflect. I need to reflect. Our listeners need to reflect. For I'm not certain what the answer is. But I wonder to myself, what was the greatest suffering? Jesus carrying the cross beam to Calvary? And the physical pain that caused as he weakened, as he lost more blood, as he fell, as his wounds were exacerbated, the lacerations... The, the, the clothing pulled away from the scabs that were slowly forming around all the places where he was beaten, um, the crown of thorns digging into his, into his head. Was that the greatest suffering? Or Jesus walking along on a very familiar road and nobody noticing? So in his heart, his, his human heart, I am going to do this for you, gatekeeper who's sweeping in front of your store. I'm doing it for you, the woman who's, you know, who's disciplining her little daughter. I'm doing it for you, the teenagers who are mocking and laughing at me because I look like a spectacle. I'm doing it for you, old man who is asleep knowing that his savior is walking by, not a clue that that's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an interesting question. It's the, it's, it's the fact that Jesus, it was inescapable that Jesus did this um, essentially alone, even with his mother behind him. This was for him to do. And in the end, they were at a distance. This was the moment that the Lord and his father, okay, um, walk this path and perhaps the greatest suffering of all was 
Jesus enjoyed the immediate vision of his father his entire human life. He had an undivided heart. And yet in death, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And we know in that psalm it ends with confidence. But there was abandonment. So that which he enjoyed his whole life for a brief moment was not even there in his total self-gift. That's remarkable. I mean, that's just, that defies description. It actually defies the human ability to totally appreciate what's really going on. But this year, I have kind of committed myself to look at the, the other actors we often don't think about. Okay, so the father of evil lurking around, the passerbys. What did Jesus mean when he said to the daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children. What was he really intent? What was he trying to teach them? Why should they weep if he's on their way to save them? Hmm. Is it because they won't listen? Because they won't accept the message? Hmm. Right? Think of poor Simon, the Cyrenian. Right? He's confiscated in to carry the cross. He did not want to. Why? Because it's a sign of shame. Right. He didn't want to. So what do you think happened to him when all was said and done? Did he just go off to a place? What about the nameless soldiers that spat on him, slapped him, scourged him, put on... Who put the crown of thorns on him? What's his name? Where'd he go? What's his family like? Where'd he come from? And what happened to him? Right? Yeah. Because all those nameless, faceless people, we could put names and faces on them because sometimes we're the ones who do those things. They're precisely nameless because I could put Frank Caggiano on some of them in different parts of my life. And, and for me this year in particular, my heart has moved to, to go and really spend some time in prayer with and, and ask those questions. Um, because I may find myself in the story of the passion in some of them. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, it uh, gives us, gives me and all of us something really to really go back and ponder and meditate on and try to immerse ourselves in. Hmm. Can, can I ask you, Excellency, you know, you were talking, you mentioned last year about Jesus... Um, on the cross and his death and how that was in doing that he you said he conquered death from and sin from the inside out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can you can you explain that again to us yeah because in many ways one I could ask the question why the incarnation at all why why would why could not have God redeemed creation, redeemed humanity from the outside in, that is, impose it from the outside, or just give it as a gift. But he did it from the inside out, that means he emptied himself and became one of us. So the greater became the lesser. Why? So that the lesser become the greater. Well, I think part of it rests with the fact that we are the image and likeness of God, and the incarnation fulfills the divine likeness in us. But I also think it is the very nature of who love is, which is what God is. God is love. That love doesn't do things from afar. Love involves itself in the most intimate details of one's life. It wants to be one with the beloved. So the very essence of love demands from the inside out. So when you love someone and they are in need, what would you not do for them? In fact, if it were possible, would you not take on their sickness and suffering for yourself to free them? Is that not from the inside out? And if we sometimes the pathetic sinners we can sometimes be do that could you imagine he who is perfect love that's exactly why he did it from the inside out 
And the entire passion of the Lord proves love does not have to feel good. So let's get that out there. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. It doesn't have to, it doesn't. Right? Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, one more question about um, about Good Friday. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and it kind of ties in because it's now the year of Saint Joseph. Um, mm-hmm. uh, my wife and I just we finished on March nineteenth uh, the consecration of Saint Joseph, mm-hmm. um, and one of the ideas that came up there, and I went back to try and find it, and I couldn't find it, but I'm almost positive it's from from that was that um, the care and the love and the guidance that Joseph gave to Mary and Jesus during his life, um, that, uh, that well of strength that he you know, kind of set them up with, Mary leaned on that as she watched Jesus suffer and die. What do you, what do you think about that idea? Explain it a bit more. So... Because he had given her a lifetime of of love, mm-hmm. and 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 uh, built her strength in that way mm-hmm. by knowing the love that he gave her, the guidance that he gave her. Joseph. Gave Joseph. Her. That's right. Yep. Mm-hmm. While they were married and while he was alive, mm-hmm. then she was able to draw on that when she was not. And I I don't think Father was saying that that's the only thing that carried her through, but that. That was something significant that he had given her almost as a gift that she could kind of lean on as she's watching their son. I, I, I would not debate it at all. I mean, yeah. I think that makes perfect sense. But I, I, I would suggest that there is an intimacy, there is an intuition between a mother and a child that a father does not have. Yeah. There's a different type of intimacy because you bear the child in your own body. And I must confess, if I were to try to ascribe a source of strength to Our Lady, um, that intuition is probably the greatest source of her strength. With her son. She knew, she, right, Mm -hmm. she knew in her heart this could not be the end right and it would not be the end but no one else would have had that intuition in the same way right? yeah but yeah of course joseph absolutely and of course joseph died tradition holds before jesus had his his passion and death so he died on the other side of the offer of eternal life which of course was applied to him But Joseph did not go directly to heaven because heaven wasn't opened yet right? in that sense. right? So it's interesting. He was with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. And in the descent among the dead, right, when Jesus, what do you think was the reaction of Joseph when he saw (laughs) Jesus? Right? And he led his earthly father, his foster father, to paradise talk yeah. about a beautiful moment yeah mm-hmm. so then uh with that then let's move on to easter no no holy saturday my friend okay. Holy saturday right, let's, my let's, favorite day of the year i'm rushing i, I don't mean to <laughs> rush <laughs> <laughs> no because you know like i said last year it's my favorite day of the year not because it is this the year uh, it's not not because it's the day that gives us the gift of salvation because it's not but it's the parable of everyday life it's the parable of everyday life right absolute guarantee see suffering Mm -hmm. not necessarily always see resurrection but you hope for it that's life that's christian discipleship right um where was everybody on holy saturday it's another question i wondered to myself what was Pilate doing? All those crowds, what were they doing? What are the soldiers? Were, were they crucifying somebody else, I suppose? Just then to the next victim? Did anybody wonder to themselves? After the earth quaked, 
right? And the and the rock split and the temple split. Would anybody have said to me, that's kind of odd <laughs> <laughs> that right. this happened? Yeah. Right? W where were they on Holy Saturday? Where was Our Lady? We know Mary Magdalene went back to the tomb and presumably Our Lady would have also, right, to care for her son. It was interesting, in St. Alphonsus Liguori, in the 14th station, in his meditations, it says something very beautiful, which I, it, it, never, it never dawned on me till this year. It struck me like a ton of bricks. It says, and they, laid, they brought Jesus' body to the tomb where Our Lady laid it out with her own hands. Now let's think about that for a moment. See, we have this image of the Pietà, which is the 13th station. Poignant, beautiful, moving. But the 14th station, when Jesus is actually laid in the sepulcher, and, she, and Our Lady, according to St. Alphonsus, puts him there with her own hands. And then she walks out. That's the moment, right? of extreme grief to walk away. Because while you're holding him, there's still something to hold on to. So when she left the tomb, closed the stone over, what was Our Lady feeling? In the deepest level of her heart, she believed this would not be the end. And we talked about it last year when we talked about Easter Sunday. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say the Lord went to visit Our Lady. He had to have. He right. had to have. Yeah. And even if he didn't, she would have known he rose from the dead. The intuition again. The intuition. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I know you have a... a uh, devotion to Mary Magdalene, as you mm -hmm. call her, the apostle of the to the apostles. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. the first one to get there Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why, why? Okay, another question. I, again, another question. Why did the women not run? Okay, John was the only exception of the apostles. So there's one apostle, and all the women stayed. Why the women and not the men? Anybody want to ask that question? Because the women, at least in my estimation, were the disenfranchised ones in the ancient world. Okay? They didn't have ambition because all those doors were closed to them. They didn't have to worry about the uppers, you know, the uppity ups, because they considered them less than uh, worth their time. So in that debasement, they were free. Okay. They weren't conflicted as much. So in some sense, right, the women really had already lost what the men were grasping for, who betrayed the Lord, who beat the Lord, who in the status, con you know, co condemned him to capital punishment because they were playing the game. And in that freedom, they came to faith. And Mary Magdala, who was freed from seven demons, she waited. And she was so, and she was so free, <laughs> free from the constraints of the world, free from the demonic possessions that had conflicted her, that she just waited in the garden. I mean, it's remarkable <laughs> when you yeah. think of it. Yeah. And... That's how that's how it should be for each of us, right? Our our encounter with Jesus should change us in that way. This this uh, show that I mentioned to you a couple weeks ago, Excellency, the Chosen, um, mm -hmm. about Jesus and his apostles. There's this remarkable scene in like the second episode where Nicodemus is amazed at Mary's transformation from her exorcism, and he he confronts her in the streets. He wants to know. A, how she was healed of the demons that, you know, that possessed her. And she looks at him, Excellency, and she says, All I know is that I was one way, 
now I'm completely different. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. thing that happened in between was him. Right. 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 And in the end, the great mystery of Holy Week is the invitation to surrender. It's the invitation to humility. Okay. You want to play the games in life? You will miss the Lord. You want to play the games of modern society? You will scourge the Lord. If you want to be worried about ambitious and getting ahead and what people think and making sure your name is clean and not causing waves and going with the crowd and being with the flow and being like everybody else, you will crucify the Lord. But if you let it all go, as painful as it is, what are you left with? To see the Lord. An empty tomb. Freedom this world couldn't possibly imagine. Couldn't possibly imagine. It wouldn't be as broken as it is if it did. Okay? So, what was Mary Magdalene? A woman who uh, already in a society was on the lowest rung precisely because she was a woman, which is, you know, obscene, mm -hmm. but the truth of the time. She had been possessed. So how many people actually believed that she was cured, really, in the end? They probably thought she was faking it, and they would have stayed away from her. Or so she was isolated. She had no ambition because they weren't... All... And then she's free, and what does she do? She, be... she becomes apostle to the apostles and sets them free. You're in or out. Mm -hmm. You believe you don't. You come with me or you stay behind. It is what it is. Gentlemen, what do you want to do? <laughs> Fascinating, no? Yeah, yeah. And it always, it, and then it always strikes me in uh, Acts of the Apostles, where you know Luke writes that five hundred people saw Jesus mm -hmm. after his resurrection. You mm -hmm. know, it wasn't just like this small little band of people who said, "Oh yeah, we saw him." Mm -hmm. I mean, he appeared to a lot of people. Yeah, he did. And it, it made no difference to the faith of the majority, no different than 60,000 people were at Fatima and saw the miracle of the sun. Yeah. And did you see Europe get convert? I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because in the end, the great mystery, okay, of coming to faith is, are you going to be a bystander or not? And all these things that occur, that in a heart that's ready to no longer be a bystander can help someone to come to faith or deeper faith, will make no difference in a heart that still wants to be a bystander. And what does that mean? Play the game, go with the flow, be like the world, continue to play, you know, whatever it is that you think your heart really wants. Yeah. Can I um, can I just gently sh shift tracks here? Yes, um, of course you may. I wanted to uh, I wanted to see um, uh, because I love the stories of your mom and your mom's mm -hmm. food, and mm -hmm. I just wanted to see uh, what you might be doing this Sunday if, uh, mm -hmm. and then also, you know, maybe if if you have a, a specific memory that you'd like to share with the listeners, I know the listeners love it too. Oh, memories, my gosh, I have many. This year, actually, my family is coming up to Trumbull. So I'm going to be at the former residence mm -hmm. in Trumbull. Um, in part because I think for my little great niece and great nephew, who are basically kind of prisoners because of the pandemic, it gives them a little bit more latitude to be outside, which I think is good for a few days. Yes. So I will not be in, in, in our family home Easter afternoon and evening, which is what we usually do. So that's new, all right? But as for the traditions, of course, as I said last year, um, Easter was all around faith and food, church and food, right? And it changed in my life when I became a priest because I was no longer an attendee. I was, you know, the celebrant. Mm -hmm. uh, and mom would come, uh, especially when I was at St. Dominic's. Now as a bishop, it takes on even more um, more gravity, more involvement, because there's the chrism mass, which we did not speak about, but the chrism mass is 
the high point of the renewal of priestly promises, right? which is a beautiful moment for priests to remember that the Eucharist could only be born because priest was born at the same time. Yep, and that happens on Holy Thursday. Holy Thursday morning, mm -hmm. right? Which in our diocese, we used to do it on days earlier. Many dioceses do that because it's hard geographically to get all the priests together and then allow them to get home. But in our diocese, we are so tiny. Hmm. Priest who was born on Holy Thursday, the Chrism Mass should be on Holy Thursday. It's as simple as that. Right. Right. And sadly, there are some priests in our diocese who refuse to come precisely because it's on Holy Thursday. And my response to them is, your loss. Simple as that. Right? So, uh, you know, my mother made la pizza, la pizza con salsicce, and oh my gosh, that was so good. Oh gosh, it was so good. And pizza con il grano, which was sweet, with the rogota. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what, what are you? What, I'm getting are you, lightheaded. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to make anything that kind of is a, a Oh gosh, no, I said, no, no, absolutely not. I got on the scale this morning. It was, it was <laughs> a horror. <laughs> no, no, no. I said that this has got to be wrong. And on the third try, every time I was going up one tenth of a pound more. Every time I said, that's it. That's it. I'm done. No, no, no. <laughs> oh it. boy. We, <laughs> no, so we're not. They may. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Well, so uh, I, I kind of, I skipped over the listener question this week just because. There was so much richness in what you were giving us, Excellency. So we have a couple of questions lined up for Excellent. next week and the following weeks. Mm -hmm. But um, but if you're listening and you do have a question for Bishop Frank, please do send it in to us on social media, or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and so is Veritas Catholic Network. You've been listening to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Excellency, thank you so much for that reflection. I mean, it was... Uh, just thank you. Um, and and I'd like to ask if you could please give us your blessing before we go. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, as we walk with your Son, Jesus, and celebrate his agony, passion, death, and resurrection, it may be a time of renewal, of peace, and rebirth, for ourselves and all those whom we love, and for your entire church. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Steve, Amen. have a happy Easter, my friend. Thank you, Excellency. You too. Thank you so much. All the best. Bye-bye.